Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and the We Buy Guns website out of Westfield, Indiana. And you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, we take six used firearms that have come into our store, either through the front door or through our website, give you guys about a four or five minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. So if this sounds interesting to you, please stick around. It's coming up now. All right, remember the format of this video is we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses, starting us off with our first handgun. This is a very popular one. Many of you probably recognize this one comes to us from a customer in Georgia. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is a Jericho model 941. This is an FS in the silver type finish chambered in nine millimeter. The FS meaning it is on the medium frame. Now the story with this would actually begin if we go as far back as 1975 when CZ would develop the CZ-75 pistol. Now we've talked about those handguns on this channel ad nauseum. Excellent handgun if you guys are not familiar with the CZ-75, although I am sure many of you are and they have a huge following. Now the interesting thing about the CZ-75 is it had the slide which rode inside of the frame giving it a very short uh, profile on the slide, giving it not much to hold on to but keeps a very low bore axis, a very low muzzle flip and very controllable as a result. Now the CC-75 has seen worldwide success with some military and a lot of police use throughout the years. Now a couple years later, a company in Italy named Tanfaglio would come out with a copy of the CC-75 known as the TZ-75 pistol, part of the 88 series of handguns. Also very popular on the market today. Now, around the same time, if we switch over to Israel, some of you are probably wondering why we're talking about a Czechoslovakian gun when we're talking about an Israeli pistol. Well, if you are familiar with the CZ-75, you can see a lot of design influence here in this design. Now, in the 1990s, or I should say by the 1990s, Israel had been using a hodgepodge of different armaments. Now, when it comes to their handguns, you could see Israeli use of Beretta designs, like the 1951 model, uh, the uh, uh, SIG design on the sort of P226, P228 type frame, P225, if you will, uh, 1911s, uh, just a different array. You know, when it came to their long guns, you would see the same thing with M16s and FALs and Galils and Uzis and things like that. So by about 1990, Israel is looking to standardize on a lot of designs. It's true of their uh, uh, rifle program moving into the uh, Tavor series as well. Now they had put out a solicitation for a new handgun. One of the main things that Israel wanted, of course, with their new production of firearms is they wanted them to be at least in part produced in Israel. Now the designers of this, which was I, uh, IWI, excuse me, Israeli Weapons Industries, uh, had looked at the success of the CZ-75 pistol and wanted to use it as the basis for coming up with this new design, the Jericho Model 941, as it would be adopted. Now, first, they would source a lot of the parts from Tom Foglio, which is why we discussed them, as they were already making a clone uh, off of the CZ-75 design. So they would send a whole bunch of prefabricated parts from Italy over to Israel and IWI would do final assembly. Now, if we look at the CZ-75 and the 941, there are some obvious differences. IWI wanted to sort of change the stylizing of the pistol to keep it more in line with their Desert Eagle uh, type of production that had already uh, been in, in, in production. So you have similar aesthetics and lines. Now with that, you actually get a half a pound of weight added to the design which further, along with the slide inside the rail design of the 75 series, uh, with that added weight actually even further reduces uh, muzzle flip and recoil. So if you've ever fired a 941 Jericho, you will know that they are known for being incredibly light on recoil, very controllable, very accurate and durable pistols. They are actually a favorite of mine as well. Now the original uh, 941, which was the 941R, had a decocker on the frame. They would then come out with a 941F, which was identical to the R except no decocker, just a safety. And then the FS, which is this, which is just like the F, but on a shorter frame. Now these would originally be chambered in nine millimeter, but one of the popular things about this, at least in Israeli service, was the use of the 41 Action Express uh, based off of the nine millimeter cartridge. But later these would be offered in 40 and 45. Now these would start coming into the United States market as surplus in the 1990s through KBI, later OF Mossberg and Sons, and they would be known as a few different names. First, the 941 or the 941 Jericho as adopted 
Uh, they would also be dubbed the baby eagle, of course, having the resemblance of a full-size desert eagle and the smaller 940 or 45 cartridge. Uh, and then uh, O.F. Mossberg and Sons would actually bring this in as the Uzi eagle as well, kind of keeping in line with the uh, with the naming nomenclature of Israeli firearms like the Uzi. Now, these have been very popular in the United States market. IMI uh, later named, was, uh, we're producing these. Magnum Research imported them as well. So you see a lot of different manufacturers Manufacturer name and importation marks on these. This one actually imported by Century Arms, and I'll explain that too. Um, they have also come in in the full frame, the smaller frame like this as well, as typically they're manufactured on a steel construction. Uh, they do make them today actually in a polymer frame as well if you want them even lighter. Now, um, as mentioned, these are still being manufactured today by I. Uh, MI, so you can you can pick them up on the market today. And new uh, polymer frames are around the five mark. The steel frames are around the six mark. You can also get them still as imported surplus, which is what this is. This is in the silver uh, finish configuration, which indicates to me that this was actually used by the Israeli border police. So these would see IDF use as well as a lot of police and governmental use in Israel as well. So this would have come over as a surplus handgun. You can see there's a lot of sort of finish wear and stuff like that. Um, probably within the last 10 years brought in by Century Arms. So still kind of cool Israeli police uh, lineage on this as well as a really excellent design. On the market today, the surplus ones, especially in fair condition like this, or I should say better than fair, I would say good condition. There's some finish wear and stuff like that. Uh, typically, you're going to find the surplus ones between about four to six hundred dollars, depending on condition, is going to sort of determine where the price on that is going to lie. And then, of course, again, you can get the new production ones as used, and polymer ones are maybe going to run in the four to five, steel are going to run in the five to six, depending on condition and what they come with. So, anyway, really cool firearm. Happy to get that one and then share it with you guys an Israeli Jericho Model 941 FS. Okay, up next is an interesting rifle that comes to us from a local customer. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is a Marlin Model 99M1, and this one is chambered in 22 lr Now, many of you are going to notice that this looks very similar to another rifle out there on the market, and that is the M1 carbine. Now, the M1 carbine was adopted by the United States military in 1941 and would see service all the way through the 1970s, still being used in the Vietnam War conflict, particularly by the Arvin forces. Now the M1 carbine uh, fed from a detachable box magazine, chambered in 30 carbine, and it was meant to be sort of an ancillary second line use type of personal defense rifle, where people who did not have a primary job of carrying around a rifle for a living, uh, this would be vehicle drivers, cooks, mechanics, clerks, people like that, could have something light and maneuverable, easy to carry around that won't get in the way, but would have a lot more firepower than something like a 1911 and 45 ACP. Now, shelving that history for just a moment, let's move over to Marlin. Uh, Marlin is an American arms manufacturer that has been very well known for producing firearms feeding into the sporting market, and particularly, they make them at a very affordable price. Now, one of the lines that Marlin has always been known for are their 22 rifles. This particularly comes out of, the, out of the 99 series, which hit the market in 1959. Now, the Marlin Model 99 typically had a 22-inch barrel with a full-length magazine tube, uh, wooden stock that was usually very plain, had plain, you know, standard ramp rifle sights. And at the time, through the 1950s and 60s, typically sold in about the $40 to $60 mark, which today puts it around, you know, about the price of a Ruger 1022. So very affordable, and most people uh, would have it in their collection. It would sort of be like the Ruger 1022 of today. Uh, if you saw kids out hunting squirrels, it was typically with something like a Marlin Model 99. Now, going off of the popularity of and the success of the 99 line, Marlin had a stroke of genius, and this was around the mid to early 1960s. They had realized that the Marlin 99 actually in profile looked a lot like the US M1 carbine, and by this time in the 1960s, these had been used for a couple decades in US military service. You have millions of US veterans who had you know, been overseas who had either used the M1 carbine in combat or had at least trained on the pattern. So there were millions and millions of young Americans who were who were not only familiar with the design but also interested in it, where they might be able to actually use something that is sort of aesthetically similar in a less expensive cartridge like a 22 LR or for hunting small game and things like that. So in 1964, Marlin would redesign a 99 rifle to basically look like the US M1 carbine, and that is what they've done here. 
They shortened the stock. They put a handguard on it that had the top channel, just like an M1 carbine. With this one, has a sort of a two rivet handguard, but these are not rivets; they're screws. They moved the rear uh, uh, barrel-mounted ramp sight to a ramp sight back here uh, on the sort of uh, tied into the, or, or I should say, fastened into the top scope rail mount. They shortened the barrel from 22 inches to 18, giving it the same barrel profile as the M1 carbine. And they shortened the magazine tube, hiding most of it underneath the stock. So it would have the general profile of the M1 carbine, and that is the M99 M1, and that is what this is. Now these were actually very successful and it hit the intentions that they had hoped that it would hit. It was very popular with uh, returning veterans and things like that, people who had uh, used the M1 carbine and also people who may not have served but just had a general interest in M1 carbines or other types of surplus firearms that had been returning home on the market or that they had seen in you know newspapers and magazines and film reels and things like that. Now they came up with another version of this known as the 989 M2, and that uh, actually fed from a detachable box magazine just like the M1 carbine did, but they were all chambered in 22 LR. So very cool rifle. Um, these would uh, stay in production until about 1978 um, when they would sort of cease production there, uh, but uh, very popular for what they were and people generally like them. They do still have somewhat of a collector uh, collectability today, but they are not overly expensive. Typically you find them in the, in the two to $300 mark today. Uh, and they're not that difficult to find. Marlin would make about 200,000 of these. So very cool rifle. Anyway, very happy to get that one in and share it with you, a Marlin M99M1. Okay, up next is a really cool AR-15 variant, and I always enjoy getting these in. This one comes to us from a viewer in West Virginia, so thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is a Colt AR-15 9mm carbine, and specifically the model designation is the AR-6951, which is the latest of the design iterations of at least the civilian version 9mm uh, uh, AR-15 carbines. Now, the story with this would actually begin back in the early 1980s. There is a huge influx and a need for different submachine gun designs, not as a primary battle implement like we saw in World War II, like the United States Thompson or the German MP40. But these are gonna be more special force use. Now, we had seen this application start to develop, especially with the, uh, with the development of the MP5 from HK in Germany through the 1960s, and their use would expand through you know, special operations, military use, as well as police use through the 60s and 70s. Now, Colt had never really had an option in the submachine gun category Category. They had gained their success off of the Eugene Stoner AR-15 design through their military contracts of the M16, so they had this platform already built. They thought, how could we modify the design and come out with a 9mm submachine gun off of a platform that the United States has already been using? Surely this would be a great uh, implementation for, again, those special operation purposes. So in the early 1980s, Colt would start to redesign the AR-15 platform into a 9mm cartridge. And they would do this in a couple ways. First of all, you're not going to be using a DI or direct impingement type of uh, a philosophy. You're going to go with what a lot of uh, submachine guns are going with at the time, especially things like the MP5, which is a closed bolt off of the straight blowback principle. So you do have this up here so that it can interface with the charging handle, but you don't have the typical gas key you have to work with a DI system, a gas tube up underneath the handguard. Uh, very simple sort of single piece and bolt design. Uh, and on top of that, you also needed to put in an internal uh, ejector. So you would have a block that would be dropped into the magazine well also, so so that you could use a different magazine. And that would be held in place by two pins, which you see here. So if you're looking at an AR-15, one of the quickest ways you can tell, other than reading the markings, is if you see these roll pins here, there's typically been this block added for a pistol caliber conversion. Now with that, you had modified Uzi magazines or their own proprietary Colt SMG magazines, which are a double column, double feed design, which is actually a very good magazine. Now these are used today in some limited circumstances in the United States military, but were first adopted as the Colt Model 635. And there are other modern variations out, such as the RO-991 and RO-992. Now this would be used in the invasion of Panama in 1989, is really the only real prominent military application it's seen. But it has seen use of other militaries around the world, including Indonesia and Israel, of course. 
very interesting. Now, in the late 80s to early 90s, there was a civilian version that would be produced, and uh, those would be the so-called, you know, the pre-ban uh, 9mm ARs. Those are typically noted as having an A1 style upper receiver with attached carry handle, thin profile barrel, of course, being a 9mm in semi-automatic, and then through the assault weapon ban era, they would not have the bayonet lug attached. Now, after 2004, Colt would start producing these again, uh, and then they would resume having the bayonet lug on them, again, uh, with a fixed carry handle. Now, the recent variations, and the most recent, I should say, which is this one, the AR-6951, is a flat top upper that is probably the quickest way to identify it and you can still buy them brand new on the market today uh, retail price on them is around twelve hundred dollars used depending on what they come with and condition and things like that for example this one has six magazines you're typically going to find them around the thousand dollar mark or so uh, give or take but anyway very cool firearm the colt ar6951 based off of the colt model 635 submachine gun all right, up next is another interesting Marlin 22. This one coming to us from a viewer in Nevada. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. This is one that some of you, if you've been around a while, may recognize. This is a Marlin Model 70P, P standing for Papoose. And what you essentially have here is a takedown version of the famous Model 60 line or later Model 70. I'll explain all that in a minute. You move this out of the way. As you can see, it comes in a takedown case, and you have the barrel that will just slide on. You have a little collar that threads down. This comes with a tool that's actually in the bag that you can use to tighten down this barrel barrel collar nut. And what you essentially have here is a sort of backpacker survivalist little 22 rifle based off of the Marlin Model 60 design with a detachable magazine and a scope. Now, we did talk about the Marlin 99M1 and the design off of the 99 series, and this follows a lot of the same history, so I'm gonna rehash some of that. So as mentioned, in 1961, Marlin would come out with the 99 line. Now, the thing about the 99 that was revolutionary for Marlin is previously to that, their very popular series of 22 rifles was the 89 series. Now, the 89 series was a machined tubular steel magazine, which actually weighed about seven pounds, which is pretty heavy for a small 22 plinking rifle. Also on top of that is they're expensive to manufacture, which makes the retail cost a little bit higher. So Marlin would come up with a uh, alloy receiver design, which would actually lighten the weight by about a pound, and that would be the Model 99 series, again introduced in 1961. Now this was a very popular rifle line, as mentioned, they had come out with many different variations, including the uh, 99M1 and the 890, am I saying that right, 989M2, uh, uh, that we had just discussed. Uh, you had the detachable box magazine versions, you had those with uh, tubular magazines, and they were very affordable. Later, they would have the Glenfield line, which would be even further economized. So uh, really of the day, the model, it was really pre-model 60, the model 99 series, was what everybody had when it came to having a plinking 22 rifle. Nowadays, we kind of say that the uh, Ruger 1022 has kind of taken over that throne. Before the day, it was the 99 series. Now, in 1967, Marlin would rename the series, actually diverging into two, into two different lines, the Model 60 line and the Model 70 line. They were functionally the exact same rifle, except the Model 60 was tubular magazine fed, and the Model 70 was a detachable box magazine like this. Now, going off of the success of the line, they had actually looked at what essentially they had here in a basic semi-automatic rifle design, and they had noticed another rifle that had actually been out on the market for some time. Now, in 1964, Armalite had introduced a survivalist rifle. It's a takedown rifle, much like this, that was seeing a lot of popularity on the market. People definitely really liked them, especially in that backpacker, camper, survivalist type of area of the market. Beyond that, Armalite was actually even securing military contracts with the design for air crews and stuff like that as a backup, stowable survival rifle in case an aircraft went down or something behind enemy lines and the crew needed to use something for self-defense or for hunting small game to survive, things like that. Now, in 1986, Marlin would actually come up with their first version of the Model 60 takedown rifle, which was this, but it was a magazine fed, so it was in the 70 series or the Model 70 line, so they know, uh, they called it the Model 70P, or P for Papoose. 
Now, as I showed you, this came in a very convenient stowable carry case and was reminiscent to the designers at Marlin of what a you know Native American child would be carried around in by its mother, which is known as a papoose. So today, you know, culture, PC culture probably wouldn't put up with that, <laughs> but you know, that was sort of of the time that was where they came up with this design. Now in the 1980s, they would actually sell them in the kit with a little rimfire scope. This, I do not believe is original. This is Tasco. I don't, I tried to find what the brand of manufacturer, I don't know if Marlin made them themselves. Uh, so I, I doubt that this is original to it. But in the 1990s, Marlin would discontinue selling the rifle with this scope. And these are still, as far as I can find, still manufactured today. Typically you find them in a synthetic stock configuration. They have the 70 PSS, which is the stainless steel uh, barrel and uh, receiver, you know, looking, you know, uh, sort of aesthetic as well. But really, by and large, the design is about the same. They were always very affordable as well, keeping in line with the general cost of uh, what their Model 60 and Model 70 rifles would cost, cost, which is in today's dollars, maybe around $200 to $250. A very cool rifle. This one is in excellent condition. Still has original Marlin stickers down here on the bottom. Uh, let's see, target shot by, it has the person's name signed here. So anyway, very cool. Butt plates in great condition. It's a really excellent condition rifle. Uh, and it's original carry bag. Now on the market today, they are not super expensive. You could pick them up today between about three and $400, depending on what they come with. I've seen a couple outliers at auctions go for six to 700. Don't know why those particularly went that high, maybe first year production or something. But by and large, most of them fall between about three, uh, three to 500 or so. so. Anyway, really cool little rifle, and I know that these are popular. Whenever we get the little papoose rifles in, there's always people who seem to gravitate towards them. Uh, just fun little survivalist takedown rifles. So anyway, happy to get that one in and share it with you guys. Okay, up next is a beautiful revolver. This one's a Colt. Everybody loves these old Colt retro boxes. This one comes to us from a local customer. This is a Colt New Frontier, and this one is a 22 LR. Open this up here. Now they did make these as convertible 22 LR and 22 Magnum. This one's a 22 LR only, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. First, the history here. Now, this is very clearly modeled after the Colt Single Action Army. The Colt Single Action Army would come out from Colt in 1873. Now, the Roland White patent would expire in 1869, which would lead sort of the headway for the Single Action Army to be produced. The Roland White patent was a patent that was enjoyed by Smith & Wesson. Uh, which allowed them to make things like the number three large frame revolvers, later the Schofield with the latch system being changed. I have a full detailed video on that topic. Now, uh, Smith & Wesson had exclusivity to the board through cylinder, but when that Roland White patent would expire in I'm sorry, 1869, Colt would quickly get to work on what would later become the Single Action Army, released in 1873. Most notably chambered in 45 Colt, however, it would be offered in Marriott different calibers uh, through its main first production run from 1873 to 1941. Typically accredited as being sort of the typical cowboy western six-shooter uh, and would serve within the United States military as well. Now, in 1941, production on this would cease at Colt because of the World War II war effort. Colt had large, large military contracts, specifically with things like the Colt 1911 uh, service, uh, 45 caliber semi-automatic uh, pistol. So things like the Single Action Army would not see much use in World War II unless you were General Patton, of course. Now, at the conclusion of World War II, we're getting through the 1940s and early 1950s. In American pop culture, there seems to be a lot of interest growing in this sort of Western genre, old cowboy type uh, magazines, comic books, uh, books, stories, movies, things like that, so the spaghetti westerns and that sort of nature. So there's a lot of interest in that type of stuff, and we start to see the market increase on used, old, pre-World War II cult single action armies. Furthermore, what people are doing is taking the design and trying to modernize it by putting things like target rear and front sights on them, changing around the grip scales and the hammer contours and things like that to make them more of a target, you know, competition type model, more fun out on the range. Now, one company in particular is noticing this. It's not Colt, it's actually Ruger. Ruger decides it's going to try and capitalize on this old, you know, cowboy Western type genre interest. And in, in, I'm sorry, 1953, they would come out 
with a revolver called the Single Six. It was a 22 LR single action revolver. And two years after that, they would come out with a very famous Blackhawk line, which is still around today, which is exactly what they saw on the market. It was original single action army designs with upgraded target sights and hammers and grips and things like that. Now Colt, who is noticing Ruger enjoying much success off of Colt's lineage of the single action army design, decides to reintroduce the single action army. So in 1955 they would do so and collectors would dub this as the second generation of single action army. Now at the time there's also a famous wildcatter named Elmer Keith. He's very popular for helping create cartridges like the 44 Magnum, the 41 Magnum. He would take different uh, existing cartridges and overload them and try and push things to their limits and he would work within the industry to come up with really cool and innovative firearm and specifically ammunition concepts and designs. Now Elmer Keith, he himself had taken original flat top Colt single action armies and added target sites and things like that and actually prior to Ruger entering the market with these types of concepts had gone to Colt and begged them to come out with a production model target single action army if you will. Finally, um, Colt would actually decide to do this, whether it was because of Elmer Keith or because more, it was probably more likely they were seeing Ruger killing the market with this type of concept. In 1962, Colt would offer the New Frontier. Now, the New Frontier was offered in the original calibers. It was in the original scale single action army, but it would incorporate things like a rear target sight, rear front sight. Uh, the hammer contours would actually be changed to clear the rear sight. But beyond that, it was actually more or less a single action army that had been updated. It was a lot like what the Black Hawk had been doing. Now, furthermore, Colt was noticing the success of the single six line, which was the 22 version. Um, also, uh, the Bearcat series, uh, the single action sort of rimfire uh, versions of the single action army. So in 1970, Colt would come out with two rimfire versions of the single action army on a seven, seven eighth scale. That would be the Peacemaker 22 and the New Frontier in 22, just like this. Now they were very, very popular revolvers. They saw really good sales and they were very successful and would actually stay in production actually for a short period of time between 1970 and 1977. Now in 1982, uh, production on this would actually resume. However, they would make one simple modification and that would be a crossbar safety inside the frame. Now, fortunately, Colt made this a very uh, inobtrusive or a very uh, low profile safety, something you can't easily observe. And you guys won't be able to see that too well. I have my uh, manual focus set, so you might be able to see that there. I'll get a slow pan of this. There's a safety bar right inside underneath the loading gate. So of course, a typical function would be you would open the loading gate and go to half cock, load your ammunition, and then when you are loaded, you would typically load a chamber, skip a chamber, load four, and then so when you were done, you would pull the hammer back and then rest it down completely all the way down and you would be indexed over an empty chamber. You could do the same thing here. The firing pin is actually inside the frame. The original New Frontier model still had the firing pin mounted onto the hammer face, but that would be the safe way to carry a single action army. In this regard, because lawyers and stuff are getting involved, negligent discharges and people not necessarily knowing the safe way to carry the revolver, uh, what you would do is go to half cock, load your ammunition, and then you would be able to push the crossbar safety, which is really just a hammer block here. Now, interestingly enough, from the half cock position, that remains engaged. But when you go to full cock, it actually automatically disengages the safety bar, now being able to be fired. So why that was really put there, I don't know, especially because you, again, would go to half cock, put your safety on, load the revolver, and I guess if you carried it like this, this would be, I guess it's not really a safety notch. If you go, yeah, so you would have to go to full cock from that position. If you wanted to carry it like this, that would protect it in case you dropped it and broke the hammer and sent it into the back of the, the striker. That firing pin block would be there and save the gun from going off. But beyond that, if you go to full cock, you're disengaging it, drop it all the way down. You can't re-engage it with it in the down position. So what purpose that serves, I do not know. Um, interesting revolvers, really uh, just kind of an interesting piece of uh, Colt single action development and history and a lot of collectors on these sorts of things. On the market today, I see these things all over the place. Of course, early 70 to 77 production is gonna be a little bit more valuable without that crossbar in there. But I'm seeing them, whether they're the 80s uh, model or the 70s model, 
Uh, I'm seeing them uh, anywhere from about $600 to $1,000 plus, depending on condition and what they come with. So anyway, very interesting revolver. Happy to get that in. That is a Colt New Frontier 22. Okay, last but not least, we have a very classic one that comes to us from a viewer in Michigan. This is a SIG Model 556 Classic, chambered in 556, as the name would suggest. Now, the story with this would actually begin, if we go back sort of just post-World War II, we have a lot of different countries around the world are trying to modernize their military equipment, things like the FAL, uh, the SETME Model C, the G3, you know, full-powered rifle cartridge, either semi or fully automatic rifles or so-called battle rifles are starting to take hold. Now, if we look at Switzerland at the time, they are also moving away from their Swiss bolt action uh, rifles or straight pull bolt action rifles and getting into their first sort of battle rifle design. And the first one would be adopted as the SIG SG510 or the Sturmgewehr 57 model. Now, for those of you not familiar, I'll roll up a picture on the screen. It was a very large, cumbersome rifle. It still kept the beer keg style charging handle that you would see on a straight pull rifle, Swiss rifles. Actually, really beautifully manufactured rifles, just complicated to manufacture, big, bulky, and heavy for what they are. And on the civilian market today, some automatic versions of those are actually pretty valuable and collectible. Now, through the Cold War, like most other countries in the 70s and the 80s, everybody's looking at moving into an intermediate rifle cartridge, something that's more of the assault rifle type pattern. Intermediate cartridge, shoulder fired, select fire. And Swiss, uh, Switzerland would be no different. So uh, SIG, uh, through the 80s, would development, or, I'm sorry, develop a, a rifle series called the SG550. And the rifle version of that would be adopted by Switzerland as the STGW90, and that was in the year 1990. Now, corresponding with that, Switzerland, one of the cool things about their culture is they've always wanted their civilian population to keep up on sort of uh, maintaining a firearms. Uh, and even as you would uh, be in the Swiss military, as you would leave, you would keep your SIG 550 series rifle. The, the state would issue you ammunition. You would qualify with it and actually retain and maintain ownership of it. In fact, Switzerland firearm culture is probably the closest you can get to American firearm culture with private citizen ownership of firearms, but they would keep full auto select fire 550s. Now, for those people not in the military who also wanted to keep up with, you know, military, I'm sorry, with, with marksmanship training and practice, uh, SIG would release a rifle called the PE-90. It was just like the 550 series rifle, the full-length rifle. However, it was not select fire, semi-automatic only. Now, jury's kind of out on how this happened, but about 50 of those PE-90 rifles made it over to the United States in the 1980s and were sold off to the civilian population. Because very few of them exist, they are exceedingly uh, rare and valuable and expensive on the market, somewhere between ten dollars and $20,000 if you find one, uh, which is like transferable machine gun pricing, even though it is a semi-automatic rifle, but it is the closest you can get to an original SIG 550 that Switzerland would issue as its rifle, or combat rifle, uh, it's closest you can get here in the United States. Now, uh, prior to 1989, SIG would also create an export model, just the SIG 550 for the United States uh, market. And that would basically be like the PE-90, but lack some of the military features such as the bayonet lug, and would also not have the grenade launcher ring on it. Now, very few of those would actually be imported before the 89 and 94 uh, assault weapons ban, the 89 import ban, and the 94 assault weapons ban. So still those, even those SIG import 550 rifles, are very hard to find. Now, setting up all that history through the 1990s, of course, you have the assault weapons ban, and nothing like the SIG 550 series is coming into the market. 2004, assault weapons ban is completed. There is a growing demand on the U.S. commercial market for a SIG 550-style rifle. Now, you could get the pre-ban models, but even then, they were incredibly expensive, exceeding a lot of people's budget, so most people just went without a 550 series of rifle. Now, SIG Sauer in the USA, uh, the USA domestic branch of the sort of SIG Swiss German concern, um, came out in about 2006 with this rifle, which they dubbed the 556. Now, essentially what this is, is this is a 551, which is the carbine version of the 550. However, it was made to be used with standard AR-15 magazines, uh, 556, of course. And it actually made quite a splash on the commercial market. Now, some of the problems as we get through 2007, 2008, this is the era of the growing manufacture of AR-15 rifles. 
Prior to that, you know, you were basically uh, left with Colt or Bushmaster products, which for AR-15s were pretty expensive. By 2008, 2009, a lot of other manufacturers are coming into play and the pricing of these things are getting way lower. Now, these are coming out at a brand new retail price at about the $1,200 to $1,400 range back then. So for other things in 5.56 you could get, they were just a little bit too expensive and SIG would end up phasing them out. Uh, gosh, when did they, they stopped producing these officially in about 2018, 2019, somewhere around there. Now they came out with different versions of these. There was the 551A1, which actually used the original pattern Swiss magazines. Uh, they had the XI or the German, or German, the uh, Russian model, the R uh, using 762 by 39. And then they had the SWAT version, which was like this, but had all the, you know, tactical rails and stuff like that. Today, again, they are not manufactured, so steadily going up a little bit in value. The 550 Classics in good condition are settling around $1,000 to $1,200 or so, uh, which is where something like this might be. So anyway, this is an earlier one with sort of the, the Parkerized type receiver finish, which is pretty cool. But anyway, very cool to get that one in and share it with you guys, and we will end the video here. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that thumbs up button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and the We Buy Guns website. You are watching Marksman TV, and we will see you next time.